Welcome to today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light. Sun, Salt, and Light, S-O-N, knowing and growing in your daily relationship with Jesus Christ, but also being the salt and the light in your marriage, in your family, at your place of work, at your church, and even in the community you're in. I'm Pastor Michael Petit. This is a radio ministry of our church, Calvary Chapel Divine, here in Divine, Texas. We are so glad that you joined us for today's broadcast. We are a Calvary Chapel, so we simply teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We believe that God uses His Word to transform, restore, and to change lives one verse at a time. If you're visiting our area, you'd like to get information about our church or church service times, maybe even track down some of the other teachings that we have available through podcasts, whether it's through Audible or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can do all of that at our church website at calvarydivine.org. That's calvarydivine.org. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. So who wrote the book? Well, pretty obvious, right? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. But you know what the problem is? The problem is liberal scholars. Liberal scholars believe that Peter didn't write this book. Now, we have very bluntly in Scripture, it says Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, right? We know that he wrote the book, but they argue that he didn't. They say there's no way that Peter could have spoken the way that he spoke. That he, there's no way he would have understand the Greek the way that it's, it's translated here. That he never would have quoted Paul. That's what liberal scholars say. And I would tell you, stay away from liberal scholars because they will get you in a lot of trouble. If the Word of God tells you Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, at the very beginning of the letter, that's who wrote it. That's who wrote it. What, what, I, what I have an issue with when we look at that is Peter is a liberal scholar has no indication... That the Holy Spirit couldn't do that. That the Holy Spirit couldn't take someone like Peter and allow him to eloquently speak in Greek because he's just a filthy fisherman. There's no way. Right? And I can tell you straight up, as, as your pastor, uh, I can tell you before Christ, academically suspended from two universities, for math, I couldn't pass math to save my life. I would always get to algebra, and whenever I got to algebra, I failed every time. And then they would academically suspend me, and I would get kicked out. Then I came to know Jesus Christ, and I decided I'm going to go get my theology degree. I have my theology degree. But if you were to look back, and you would have said the same thing about me. There's no way that God would use him or her, or anyone else. Like, that's how they, they approach these things. And, and so we need to be very careful when, when I believe, when it's so obvious in Scripture, why are you trying to overthink it? It's given to you. He's the author. Simon Peter, a disciple of Christ. And I love that. I love that. And, and how did he get the name Peter. In John chapter 1, verses 40 through 42, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him and was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, He found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall now be called Caiaphas, which is translated Peter, and which, which actually means... So the original Rocky is Peter, because that's what it means in the Greek, is Rocky or rock. And it's a small pebble, not, not a big pebble or a big rock. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, not, not Peter. So when we, when we think about that, we, people will tend to, to get that mixed up, to think that the church was built upon Peter, and it wasn't. It was built upon the chief cornerstone. If you look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, it says, Now when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he was asking his disciples, 
Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He said to him, uh, said to them, but who do you yourselves, who do you yourself say that I am? Probably one of the most important questions you'll ever answer in your lifetime. It's not about who other people say Christ is. Who do you say he is to you? And he poses that question. Nobody answers but Peter. Simon Peter answered him and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of John, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, small rock, small pebble, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. But we know through looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, we know who the chief cornerstone and who it's built upon. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the, chief, or being the cornerstone. In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple, the Lord, and in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So we have the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and then the apostles and the prophets, and then us, one by one. So think about that. So when we think about Steve or Steve, we got Steve, we got three Steves now. God said, Mike can't remember names, so he gives me three Steves and an Ira. And I was like, praise God. I was like, I can, I can remember those names. But he builds upon the chief cornerstone, upon Jesus Christ. And then the apostles and the prophets. And then us. We have to understand who Peter is and one of the things we see is that, that Simon Peter was from Bethesda and he lived in Capernaum and he worked the coast of the Sea of Galilee. This is the thing that breaks the whole Catholic Church. Peter was married. The first pope was married, so it just breaks the whole, the whole house crumbles on that one thing. And then it's in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 5, it says, Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Caiaphas? Because they were taking Simon and uh, James and Jude were actually taking, and Peter were actually taking their wives with them on their missionary journeys. They were with them. We also know that Peter had his, what, mother-in-law that got sick. And Jesus healed her. Now most men in this room would be like, no, Lord, it's okay. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we see that, that he was married. He was the brother of Andrew. And Andrew had followed and, and, and heard from John the Baptist the proclamation of Jesus was the Lamb of God in John chapter 1, verses 35 and 36. And then Andrew immediately goes and grabs his brother in Luke chapter 5, verses 3 through 8. And it says, Then he who got into his boat, got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. So there is a crowd of people wanting to hear Jesus speak. And so he jumps in Simon's boat, and he has Simon push off just a little bit, so where he could teach from the boat. Now, anybody who's ever been to Calvary Chapel, Hawaii, they do church on the beach. Most of them do. I don't know how you do that. I've been to Hawaii. I don't know how you do that. I would be so staring at the ocean and, and, and be lost very quickly. But you can imagine this is happening. But he says when he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out to the deep and let down your nets for a catch. 
But Simon answered and said to him, Masters, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. You know, if, if any of us have ever been fishing, we always think, there's just one more cast, right? And if you're a petite, you just throw expensive things at the water and catch nothing. That's our life. We enjoy fishing, but we don't catch anything. But you can imagine this filthy fisherman, Simon. Man, I know these waters. I've worked these waters. No, go ahead and cast out. We were doing this all night. And yet, he listens and he says, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at his knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You know, at the end of the day, it goes back to the scripture that, that Johnny Cash was reading there, and he was talking, holy, holy, holy. When we have an encounter with Christ, what happens is we come to him just like Isaiah did with unclean lips. And, and as we see, this is part of the reason why most Christians, most followers of Christ can identify with Peter. Peter. Because we have been in that place where we say, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Like, you don't know me. Yeah, he does. He knows you. He loves you. He wants you to return to him. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to worship him. But that's what happens is we, we forget that this is Peter. When we think about Peter, a lot of times what we get wrapped up in is all of Peter's bumbles and stumbles. We forget that it was the humanity of, of Peter as he is in this moment just saying, Depart from me for I am a sinful man. We also forget it was Peter in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. It says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea, for they, worship fishermen, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. These were ignorant fishermen. These were these were the people you wouldn't. These would have been oil workers. Like, they know how to, to run pipe. A plumber. Like, this is who Jesus picks. He could have went to the temple and told the rabbi, give me your best students. But no. He picked a bunch of Degenerates. And that's the beauty of us following Christ. He picks the, the foolish things of the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. This is why liberal authors and, and theologians can't grasp this concept because they've gotten to a place where they think that God can't do the work in somebody's life. God can. God, God, what's so beautiful, man, God used, so imagine this, modern day today, God would have used a BLM member and an Antifa member and a, a J6 member because he, he, he had people that wanted to overthrow the Roman government. And yet God said, come on, Jesus, walk with me. He takes them. He takes a tax collector. None of you want to hang out with a tax collector. You're thinking, man, I go to, go to lunch. Is he watching what I'm spending? We're, we're afraid of tax collectors today because of all the tax collectors that have been hired by the government. Right? But this is who Jesus picks. He picks me and you. The weak things of the world. The foolish things of the world. And that's the beauty of Christ because when that happens, 
you get to see God move and not the individual. Who gets the glory then? God does. Because they look at it and go, oh, there's no way. My son said this the other day when he was teaching. He goes, I, I still can't believe my father's a, a pastor like he's teaching. Matthew taught, and he was like, man, I, if you would have told me, I would have said, you're out of your mind. And that made me happy because I'm like, yeah, because God gets the glory. I'm a foolish thing. I'm a weak thing. I'm a knucklehead. I'm just like Peter. One of the things we know about Peter is Peter was always a leader. And he not only, as Peter is transformed and, and walking with Jesus, Peter becomes one of the, the and is the leader of the, the disciples. And there was Peter, James, and John. When, when, Jairus, uh, when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, Peter, James, and John were there. When Jesus was transfigured on uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, we can see that, that Peter was there. And some would say that the reason why Peter, James, and John, the sons of thunder, Jesus had to keep them close. He couldn't leave them down on the mountain by themselves. He had to always keep them with him because they were crazy. They were zealous. They were, they were on fire like, hey, bring, strike them down, Lord. Do what you got to do. But he kept them close to him. In Matthew chapter 17, and you'll see when Peter, this is, this is what we most remember about Peter. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Six days later, Jesus took him, Peter, and Peter's always listed first. He was the leader. Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them and his face was shone like the sun, S-U-N. And his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. And Peter responded and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you want, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, Peter don't know what to say. So what does Peter do? Uh, too much silence. I got to talk. I got to say something. Man, Lord, this is good. But what does he say? He says, if you want, I will make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And raising their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself. See, Simon would speak at the most wrong time. He gets rebuked by God here. He gets rebuked by God. This ain't about Elijah and Moses. This is about my son. But we also know that he gets rebuked by Jesus, the Son of God, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. For the time Jesus began to point uh, to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and to be killed and to be raised up the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but man's. Some of y'all need to highlight that in your scripture today. This is why having a little app is not always healthy. It's good if you know how to do the highlighter and all that stuff and how to underline and make notes. But this is why sometimes having a physical Bible so you can and highlight that and write that down because it's like some of us are not setting our, we're, we're, we're not setting our mind on God's purposes but man's. And then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
when I thought about this, I thought about Peter, and I thought about me being young in faith. And I thought about my pastor. Pastor Joe, who mentored me, I thought, you know what, I sent him a note yesterday. I said, Joe, I love you. I'm sorry I always spoke sometimes when I shouldn't have. And said things that I probably shouldn't have. Thank you for showing grace to me and teaching me about that. And I hope I can extend that to somebody else as they're coming up in faith. We're all Peter in some form or fashion. We can always say the wrong thing. Or feel like there has to be something said and it's, it's done in the wrong heart. You know, Peter had a, uh, uh, would always try to protect Jesus. He drew his sword on, the, on Malchus and cut off his ear, the high priest's servant. There's a wonderful video that somebody had of the grandfather sharing, and he talks about how if Jesus didn't put the ear back on, Peter would have been stoned to death for striking the high priest's servant. Which is basically there was nothing that happened even though the ear was cut off, even though the sin was done, the ear is put back on and it's a representation of what our life looks like after Christ. That dude lost his whole ear, you can never tell. So if they try to bring charges against Peter, the ear is there. Same with you. When, you're, when you go to trial, it's paid in full. Your sin has been paid in full. Because you're covered by what? The blood of Christ. What washes away us our sins, right? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we have to remember that. So when we look at Peter, Peter was a man who, there were other disciples who didn't get out of the boat. Peter took that step of faith and said, I'm going to walk on, can I walk on water with you? He almost drowned. But he took some steps. And I love that about Peter. You know, Peter, you know, most of the things that we know about Peter is unfortunately his fall. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 through 35, and then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. Because, me, uh, because of me this night it is written, I will, uh, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter replied to him, even if they all, even if they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Peter didn't realize he was part of the all, right? He's part of the all. But this is his pride. This is the same pride that Peter had when he didn't want his feet, his feet washed, right? You're not washing my feet, Lord. He's like, if I don't wash your feet, you're not part of this. Then wash my whole body. Right? Wash my hands, wash my feet, do whatever you need to do. But that's pride. And Peter had that. In verse 34 of, of Matthew 26, it says, Then Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, that this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter doubled down. Peter said to him, Even if I... Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the, the same thing as well. You realize that the disciples would not have said this if Peter wouldn't have said it. Peter was the leader. And, and so Peter's pride is there. And sometimes we can be that way. Because when we, when we look at Peter, what Peter is dependent upon is who? Peter. In Matthew 26, verse 69, it says, Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard, and a slave came to him and said, You, were, you too were with Jesus and with the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he had gone out 
to the gateway, another slave woman saw him and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he, didn't, he denied it with an oath, so he swears. I do not know the man. And a little later, the bystander came up to, and said to Peter, you really are one of them as well, since even the way you talk gives you away. And then he began to curse and swear. So he goes back to the filthy fisherman. Right? I do not know the man, and immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the statement that Jesus had made before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I think the, the key to that verse and what's beautiful about that verse is you see that, that Peter, it's not just about crying. Right? Because Judas probably shed some tears too. It's the difference between conviction and condemnation. Peter had conviction. He turns back to Christ. Christ. Judas went to who? The high priest and tried to throw the money back at him. He could have went back to Jesus. But he didn't. He just felt sorry. We see Peter, the author of the book of 1 Peter, that he is, as a young follower of Christ, that he was impulsive and selfish and prideful. That he was quick to... Respond and recoil. But eventually we see that Peter is one of the ones who runs to the tomb. Very slowly as John said. Right? In John chapter 20 verses 2 through 4 it says, So she ran and came to Simon. Who did she come to? Simon Peter. The leader. To the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples left and they were running and they were going to the to the tomb. The two were running again and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter. So apparently Peter wasn't that fast. I don't know why John leaves puts that in there. But it's also Peter wanting to be with Christ. He runs to the tomb. But he also jumps out of the boat when he sees the resurrected Christ. In John 21, verse 7, it says, Therefore that the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard it, it was the Lord, and he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped from work, and he threw himself into the sea. He jumps into the sea to get to Jesus. See, when we have a repentant heart, we run to who? Christ. We run to Christ. This is one of the things about the book of, of First Peter that I love. is like he's telling you to be holy for I am holy. Our holiness is not based on Peter. It's based on Christ. And, and so we see the restoration of, of Peter here. And this is, again, why he is an apostle. In John 21, verses 15 through 17. Now when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to them, Simon Peter... Simon, on the, uh, the son, of God, uh, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Shepherd my sheep. And he said the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know, you know every that I love you. Tend my sheep. It's the same author of 1 Peter. As he is restored, that is filled with the Holy Spirit and shares the gospel. And 3,000 people come to faith. It's 
nothing that Peter did. He's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and he shares the gospel of Jesus Christ and people come to faith. It's the same Peter that healed the lame, uh, the lame beggar. It's the same Peter that spoke bro boldly before the Sanhedrin. He had been beaten, arrested. He was going to be killed. And one of the things that you're going to learn as we go through this is Peter, they killed James, the son of Jesus, or the, the brother of Jesus. They killed James. Peter was next. And where was Peter? Between two guards asleep. This man is going to be killed in the morning. And he's asleep. Why? Because he had the promise that Christ had given him. That he was going to do all these different things that were going to happen. That he was going to be the one that actually was going to go out with the Holy Spirit and... and and see the Samaritans come to faith. And, and be able to see the Roman centurion Cornelius receive the Holy Spirit. As the Jews, the Samaritans, and the Gentiles come to faith. In his hardship, he had Christ and he had peace. And so we have Peter in his later stage as he writes this book. And Peter will be martyred. He will be crucified upside down. And historical records show that his wife was martyred as well. At the same time. Can you imagine? They, they're in their somewhere between their late 70s and 80s. And they're martyred for their faith. They're crucified. And they've lived this life sharing Christ as a couple. That's a beautiful thing. Well, that concludes today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light Radio. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to submit a prayer request or get in contact with us to find out service times, you can do all of that at our website, uh, as well as get uh, our podcast at Spotify, Audible, TuneIn Radio, pretty much wherever you can find a podcast. Uh, you, you can just type in Sun, Salt, and Light, and you'll find it. 